Dublina is doing remarkable work. Um, and uh, Dublina, tell us a little bit about your background. I know that you were in the hardware chip area, and then you had sort of an epiphany, and you said, let me go hang out with Ed Boyden, and you were in his group, and now you have your own fancy lab, and you're at McGovern, and, and the Media Lab, and you're doing extraordinary things. But model to our, our, our audience, and, and people are going to be watching this online, you know, what's your background? How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so I started my scientific journey as a nanoelectronics researcher. So I was working on developing low-power electronic devices. Uh, so if you think about it, uh, the information technology right now is facing severe energy crisis. So the data centers of major corporations take as much energy as a whole country, for example, that of Turkey. And the projection says that by 2040, the computing industry will require about 10 to the power 27 joules, which is far larger in amount than what human race will, able, will be able to produce by that time. So to overcome these challenges, I was developing nanoelectronic devices, and I developed a quantum mechanical transistor, which overcomes the fundamental limitation in power of the transistors that go inside our computer. And these transistors are basically the very fundamental building blocks of computing. And if you can change the way, the amount of energy that they can consume, you can massively reduce the energy cost, energy uh, needs of information technology industry. And I also realized that some of the technologies that I was developing uh, for nanoelectronics can also help in uh, ultra-sensitive biosensing. So that was kind of my foray into the uh, kind of the world of bioengineering. Uh, but basically, before that, I didn't like biology at all as a subject. And in my high school, I chose to take statistics instead of biology. Uh, but then my interest started to grow in biology. And while working on low-power electronic devices, I realized that brain is the lowest power computer ever. So I did a steep transition from nanoelectronics and developing electronic chips to the field of neuroscience to learn more about the brain. And that's where I joined Professor Ed Boyden's group. And uh, during that time, I developed a technology which helps us to look into the biomolecular building blocks of the brain, which otherwise remains invisible uh, to other technologies. And these building blocks, nanoscale building blocks of the brain, uh, actually helps us to uh, the processing, processing of information in the brain helps through those uh, nano architectures. And then I founded my own group about two years ago, which I call Nano Cybernetic Biotrack. And the idea here in my group is to combine these fields together that is applied physics, nanoelectronics, and biology. And there are two major research directions. One is we still continue um, uh, to innovate in the field of nanoelectronics. We use atomically thin materials to develop new electronic devices, uh, specifically for energy efficient hardware for artificial intelligence, but also fusing them with biology to create novel bioelectronic interfaces. Uh, of course, for novel tools for healthcare, but also to use them to go beyond what biology can offer and to extend human intelligence. So if you see behind me, the theme is superpowers. Can we add um, superpowers to our brain? Yes, I believe we can. Uh, so uh, if you think about the brain, of course, the brain does certain things very, very well. Uh, so we have uh, you know, billions of uh, neurons, which are the computational building block of the brain. And they have each, each of the neurons have about 10,000 synaptic connections. Uh, but there are some things which the brain still cannot do very well. For example, each computational element, uh, they are kind of slow. So the computing in the brain works through uh, conduction of ions, uh, and as well as you know, folding of proteins. Uh, that um, are the processes that happens when you, when you think or the computing in the brain requires those. But those are slow processes. Uh, and also, the brain does not really react with you know, different um, kind of stimuli that you would want them to react to. Uh, so there are a few ways that you can add superpowers. And one way would be to still learn from biology and kind of um, change them a little bit. 
And there are pros and cons of that. Uh, so the pros of that is that if you use biological methods, of course, it's biocompatible. Uh, but you still have to rely on what nature already has you to offer, and then you can change it a little bit, play with it a little bit. But another way is to use completely non-biological methods. Uh, so you can use, and what you are doing uh, mostly is fusing nanoelectronics with the, with the brain in a seamless way. And the advantage there is that you can design nanoelectronics from scratch according to an engineer's dream and incorporate any functionalities that you want. If there is some mathematical functionality that you want to incorporate, you can build a device from scratch in a nanofab and uh, add that functionality. And then you can uh, fuse that in the brain. Uh, so with that, you can have unprecedented capabilities because electronics work very fast because that's based on a conduction of uh, electrons, not heavy ions. So they're super fast. So if you can combine those capabilities with the brain, you can think of, you can maybe think faster, learn faster, uh, enhance your memory. And sci-fi like things where you think of, you know, you download a software in your brain to learn a technology about which you never knew before, those are actually possible. Because brain computation just happens uh, through you know, electrical uh, signaling in the neurons. And if you can modulate these electrical signals through your devices, you have unprecedented access to your you know, body or brain, and the opportunities are just uh, immense so, vast. So Deblina, what technologies are you developing to be able to uh, do these types of things? So, you know, current technologies that are already existing, they are, you know, you, you know of the electrodes, they are very invasive, they are wired, they need to come through uh, open wound. Uh, they are millimeter to centimeter in scale, they cannot provide single neuron uh, access, and uh, also they cannot be scaled to a whole brain level. So what we are developing to overcome these challenges are subcellular size nanoelectronic devices. Uh, so these are much smaller than the size of the cell. They're wireless, untethered. They do not need to be connected to any wire. They're self-standard, free-floating nanoelectronic devices. They have a high, very high spatiotemporal precision. So they can interact with a single cell level, but they can also be scaled. So you can think of distributed nanoelectronic devices in your brain. So we have already developed a technology that in which the devices can even go inside a living cell and can be operated uh, wirelessly from outside the cell. And uh, these devices, even with the devices being in the cell, the cells still remain viable and living and very healthy. So you can think of uh, we are making uh, cyborgs at a cellular level, which is a very fundamental building block of our body. We have also, so this, uh, this is um, uh, you know, technology that we recently developed, and you have a manuscript and a review on this. Hopefully, it will be uh, you know, uh, published very soon. Another technology we have developed is where nanoelectronic devices can attach uh, to subcellular regions of neurons and can fit uh, in between uh, the neurons in the intercellular spaces to give you unprecedented uh, you know, recording and uh, stimulation at the subcellular level. So this can is also a manuscript uh, we are submitting very soon. Yeah. What do you think is the most mysterious, space, the oceans, or the brain? Oh, the brain, right. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, two last questions. What insights about the brain are now being considered for computing? Oh, uh, there are many. So we, there's this whole field of neuromorphic computing that's there. So the difference is that the computers that we have now compared to the brain, uh, few are, uh, so we still, know, we still do not know how the brain exactly works, but some knowledge that we have, uh, one is the interconnections. So right now the computers we have, uh, one transistor just connects to a few other transistors around it, but brain, uh, one neuron connects to 10,000 more, so the number of connections is one. Second, uh, the number of connections in a computer are static. They do not change, but in a brain is very adaptive. Uh, and uh, third is, of course, uh, in computing, we always care about doing very precise. Each of the computing uh, you know, bit is very precise. But in the brain, actually, there are a lot of errors. 
but there are a lot of redundancy. Uh, so though each computing step in the brain is very energy in intensive, the overall computing can be very energy efficient. Uh, so that's something we are trying to learn from the brain and apply to our computers. Last question, uh, how might future AI research be jump-started with collaboration with your research? How many? Uh, how might uh, AI and uh, brain research kind of work together? AI and brain research? Yeah, yeah. So in our group, as I said, you are already developing energy efficient hardware for AI, and you are a part of the MIT AI hardware program, and our uh, you know, research is featured there. So there is this field of artificial intelligence, which is growing very fast. And we are developing the hardware for that. Many people think that AI is all based on software. But what we often do not understand is that the hardware, the, there still needs to be a computer chip that needs to do that computing. And as I said, that um, by 2040, the projection is that the amount of energy with the current growth of AI you will need is so high that human race will not be even able to produce that. So we are developing this very uh, you know, energy efficient electronic devices. But again, uh, we can think of that any devices that you want to interface uh, with your brain or any part of the body also needs to be very, very low energy. So those energy efficient devices can also be implanted in your brain. So you can think of an unique fusion of artificial and uh, you know, human intelligence to extend uh, you know, human intelligence in future. From what you've heard, who would like to be on her team? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, do you have any spots on your team? Are you looking to hire more people? Oh, yeah, yeah. I am actually actively uh, looking for, you know, students okay. and postdocs. So ca catch her um, after, uh, yeah, help sure. build out her team and have her figure out the brain and make it less mysterious than uh, the oceans and uh, space. Thank okay. you, Dablina Shankar. Thank you very much,